So we're talking about scene 13, alternate scene 11. Um, this is another scene between Danny and Jenny Eccles. Uh, they're essentially, uh, again, with these heroin zombies. Uh, there's hippies involved in this. Uh, talk a bit about this scene. This is another Derek scene. Uh, and he also seems to uh, see Jenny as this... Uh, when we're talking about the religious aspect of this as some kind of savior, some kind of uh, Mother Teresa type, uh, although Mother Teresa wasn't uh, much of a saint, but he sees her as very saintly to these zombies that are around her. Well, Jenny and Danny were chased off the first time when they came by themselves. This time Jenny comes back with her gang from the Brownstone Stoop that we saw originally, and they come in wanting to not only just save them, they want to wash them and give them new clothes, and this is the whole peace, love, and flower power kind of thing. Uh, and she sings the slower original version of Somebody to Love, which was made famous by Grace Slick when she was with the Jefferson Airplane, but the first version, the version that's going to be used here, will be the slower version when she sang with the Great Society. So Jenny is singing this as they're washing and cleaning up Derek and his, his zombies and Derek is sort of resentful of it, and he says, get out, get out, especially with that little menace, meaning Danny. Um, and then in the, the alternate version, there's another use of uh, box violin concerto, which has an upbeat kind of thing. Uh, and it this is probably my least favorite alternate scene, but I, I wanted to keep the scene where Jenny keeps, where, where Jenny tries to clean up the zombies, so that's why I made the alternate version, but it's probably my least favorite usage of the music there, although the box song is good and has its purpose, but again, grown Danny comes in and undercuts it all. Uh, this is a character, uh, did you use this Sally character in any of your previous works? Yeah, Sally Trangazi, he is mentioned in the New York Quartet, and he's also mentioned, he was a real character. His real name was Sally T. It wasn't Trangazi, I forget, it was something like Tor Tortolo or Torricelli, it was a long Italian name with a T. Uh, and he's actually going to be one of the two lead characters when I finally do a, the final Maravelli family saga, Grand and Glorious, he's going to be one of the two main characters uh, that I'm going to use. Uh, but he appears then in the next, I guess it's in the next one, scene 14, which is dropped here. Uh, We're on scene 15, alternate scene 12. Okay, well, well then you, 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 went, you went over one here because we should be on scene 14 with the, the character of Mario uh, singing the Black Betty song, Sleezo. Let's see. Here. Is the oh, I listened to the scene that was dropped. Yeah, you said this was your least favorite one. Yeah, and this is the, this is the one basically where Danny is seen. Uh, this is the first time really that Danny is seen with some of the underworld people, Mario. They're doing some kind of transaction. For all we know, this could be one of the transactions Danny's doing for the crazy old lady in the earlier play. Remember when she's she's <laughs> sending Danny? So Danny could be doing doing a deal for her there. There's mention of Sally Trangazi. And then there's a scum uh, scumbag guy in the alley, uh, Sleezo and his sleaze posse. And they start uh, basically singing the Ram Jam song, Black Betty, about the black girl uh, as Betty walks by. And this is where Danny... Apparently, about a year has passed since they got off the bus, and so Danny is is basically this is just a way to reintroduce Betty back into the play. You know, she, he goes, "What you been up to?" And uh, she she says to him, and Danny says, "This and that." And the duo walk off together, catching up, and the lights slowly dim as they exit stage left. This doesn't have an alternate version, uh, uh, but uh, it could be dropped if if need be. But because uh, we do get Betty a bit later on, and. Uh, whatnot, but uh, uh, it, it, it's a good sort of bridging section. Uh, it's not one of the highlights of the play. Now we can go to scene 15, alternate scene 12. And in that scene, we get uh, Sally. He's very familiar with the underworld. He knows who Teddy Limbo is. Uh, Sally uh, goes into detail. Uh, talk a, a little bit about using some of these, these characters. You said that Sally was based on a real character, not a famous character, though, right? He was a, a real person. Um, he was the guy who uh, got me a job delivering newspapers for the Ridgewood Times, which is a local neighborhood newspaper in New York. And that led me into what, what I call the company, which was this mob front. 
Uh, he's mentioned also in the company stories, which is my memoir of uh, 12 or 13 memoirs that I did of uh, that uh, time in my life. And he was based on a real character. He was this white haired guy. He also got me out of the company when I wanted to get out. And then I started working for the Finest, or as it would be called in this universe, Fifest uh, supermarket. Uh, that's when I left that life behind, so to speak. Uh, but Sally here uh, and his Goomba Deuce end up singing the Golden Earring song, Candy's Going Bad. And this is why I named the character Candy, to use that song. So we get we get a, a really nice concision of Candy's backstory here. Uh, Candy running away. Uh, we hear that Candy and uh, Candy's folks have come to find her. Sort of like tra Taxi Driver, where, where we uh, uh, hear, we, at the end, we get the, the letter to Travis Bickle from the mother and father. Uh, this mother and father are a bit more active. We get that Candy has stolen something. Danny had hooked him her up with a guy named Teddy. Uh, in the song, it's just Teddy, a pimp named Ted. Uh, but I decided, gave him a mafia named Teddy Limbo. His real name, I guess, is Teddy Popper. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that Teddy Popper, Teddy Limbo character in The Grand and Glorious, I think, and retell the story of his demise, because he ends up dead, too, uh, in that book. Uh, but this is, a, this is uh, I think, one of those things where you, you were talking about really using a song that sums up the character and her backstory really well. It ends uh, very well, too, with Danny sitting comforting Candy and then Sally addressing the audience as if to Danny. Well, yeah. Danny is comforting her on the other side of the stage. Yeah. And uh, that's that's just that's just a very Bergman like moment to have have uh, Sally uh, talking to the audience as if they are the character. Because it's sort of like if Sally is looking out into the audience, he's really, in a sense, you you get that parallax of the audience somehow. He is forcing the audience to 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 think that they are more involved in the play. Mm. It reminded me uh, a little more of Ozu than it did Bergman. With you know how he composes the shots in certain ways. Yeah, uh, to a certain degree. But to have the character directly address the screen, that's definitely yeah. Bergman. Ozu wouldn't have that. You know, it, it, this is a persona kind of moment. Uh, then we get the alternate version where Sally and Deuce are singing, uh, let's see here, uh, Baby Will You Please Come Home, the Clarence yeah. Williams 19, 19 blues song. Yeah. And uh, again, this is a, a good sort of alternate version. Uh, Danny, though, is narrating the things we've seen because as in, in the original version, Candy's Going Bad, in the rock version, uh, we, we will see on the opposite side of the stage from Sally and Deuce, we'll see flashes of what's going on being mentioned in the song. Here, you're going to have that with this song, but Danny is is also giving a meta commentary to sort of, again, keep that version, to, to not let it get too far afield from the main uh, points of the play. So I think it's a good, solid uh, alternative version, but uh, again, it's not going to be as good as the rock version. The rock, the candy's going bad, uh, is so perfect a song for that moment. So would you still say that the uh, the alternate versions are a great play by themselves, or do, would you say that uh, that's arguable? I think it would be very good to, to excellent. I mean, again, it could be staged very well, and there are some stage directions that say that if certain things are dropped, you can add in dialogue. You know, the characters, the stage director, and the characters... Uh, or the actors could improvise some dialogue to maybe uh, get some of the stuff that might be lost. Uh, uh, but that's one of the things with, with theater. Um, uh, you, you have to rely on it. every performance is going to be slightly different. Uh, but yeah, the alternate version cannot be as good as the rock version by itself, I don't think. No, I don't think so either. I do think as written, reading it like that, you get a different kind of experience. But... Uh, I think as staged, I would uh, vastly prefer the rock version over any of the other versions. Yeah. Um, uh, then we get scene 16, another scene dropped. Uh, between, uh, they're singing Joy to the World. You get this Joy to the World, and then in the next scene after that, you get the uh, the rock version of Joy to the World. Yeah, but, and this, this is sort of like 
midway. This is midway through the play. Uh, it was almost literally midway through the play. So it's almost like the beginning of the play where you have the religious song versus the rock song. Here you have two identically named songs with totally different things. And Pastor Stegi feels that that the religious people, or the religious version is getting short shrifted here. So this is around Christmas time, whether it's probably 71, 72, 73, who knows. So the St. John's people sing the Christmas hymn. The uh, Jenny and her teen gang start singing the Three Dog Night song. And they go back and forth, back and forth singing. Then they sing it side by side. And so this is probably something that would end up being a 10 minute scene with sort of a battle until at the end, uh, Danny just ends the talk and he uses, th this is a, a throwback to his parents. He, my, one of my parents' favorite uh, shows was the Lawrence Welk show where they would play old stuff in the thirties and forties, old music. And uh, Danny ends with the, the ending that Lawrence Welk, this band leader used to give, to, you know, good nights. Uh, sleep tight and pleasant dreams to you kind of thing. And he sort of winks there and then th throws a kiss like The Dating Game, which was a sh game show that premiered in the late 60s. A very hippie, uh, you know, free love kind of uh, hip game show of the era. I think this leads from the Joy to the World segment, which is a, a long extended scene uh, with the two different identically named songs. Uh, to the Derek scene, I forget whether this is the scene, I'm, I'm rereading it as we're talking, uh, whether this is the scene that uh, is very essential to Derek's character. This is, I think he's just strung out here in this scene, isn't he? In se scene 17, alternate scene 13? I mean, he probably is. Um, you know, it's uh, Derek, I hate this fucking shit, and he's angry. And so Derek the zombie then sings in the one version, the Yardbirds song, Farewell. And this is this is a song that I didn't plan to do. But when I got to this point, I already had Derek doing the the uh, 13th it's floor a, elevator it's song. It's an interesting choice for a Yardbird song, too. I would have never yeah. thought of this song. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it's a song about someone who's going to kill themselves. And, yeah. and so, uh, and I thought Derek, he has the he has the 13th floor elevator song. Then he has the scene where he gets cleaned up and he's resentful. And I think... The second scene where he's getting cleaned up by the people, by by Jenny and her gang, uh, sort of unnerves him, sets him spinning. And I thought, well, I wanted to use, I, I, I have to resolve him some way. I, he has to have a final scene, and so I just, I just had this scene because I needed to him to have the resolution. The only resolution a character like him could have would be death, and so. Have him kill himself. Use the Yardbird song in the alternate version. He, you just see him, and boom, he, he blows his head off. There's no song whatsoever, and so it's the only alternate version I think that doesn't have a song, doesn't have a poem, doesn't have anything. It's just the same version of the 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 rock opera version minus the song. I was actually uh, discussing this scene uh, with someone, um, and I agree with you that it's likely his demise. But uh, we don't know if it could be sort of like the, the Mickey scene in Hannah and Her Sisters where he tries to kill himself because we only hear the sound of a single gunshot. Yeah, um, It's I mean, more than likely that he killed himself, but it could have also been a failed attempt in some respect. It could very well be, but I mean, you'd say more than likely it's going to end. Yeah. I mean, he's killing but it's himself. Still, it, uh, in either interpretation, it's still a very powerful scene. And we were talking about this um, uh, messaging back and forth, um, and it, it really works for Derek's character because you think that he's this type of person that will thrive on the misery of others, but then he kills himself, and it comes off very unexpected. You think he's going to sort of be the bane of Jenny throughout the entirety of the play, and then we get this scene about halfway through the play where he where you eliminate that threat. Well, there's all... This also goes back to the Janie, not the Janie Fitz play, the the one with the two girls, the the uh, the Lou Jack sisters, where their brother ends up killing himself after seemingly uh, straightening his his life out, and then we find we find that we we don't hear we hear about his death here. We we seemingly see his uh, suicide, and there are I think one or two other t times where someone kills themselves or maybe kills themselves in my plays. So. 
Suicide exists within the Danny Wagnerverse, and this is probably the most uh, straightforward of those iterations.